Grace and peace to you, from God the Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God's word for our consideration this morning is our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 2. Have you ever wondered why we celebrate Christmas on December 25th? It's almost surely not the actual day that Jesus was, was born. There are a couple of possibilities as to why December 25th became the traditional day to celebrate Jesus' birth. The first one uh, goes back to the, well, they both go back to the early Christian church. The early church, uh, the early Christians, <coughs> To a certain extent, we're in competition with the pagan religions. And one theory is that the early Christians started celebrating Jesus' birth on December 25th to counter the pagan celebration of the winter solstice. Uh, at that celebration, the, the, the pagans celebrated the birth of the invincible sun. S-U-N. Christians, of course, celebrated the birth of the Son, S-O-N, of God. There's evidence to suggest that that's where it came from. The other possibility is a bit more complicated. In fact, I always have a hard time remembering it. I have to, I have to look it up. There were those in the early church who thought that they accurately determined that Jesus died on March 25th, that they knew the actual day that Jesus died. It was also commonly believed at that time that religiously significant people died and had been conceived on the same day. So if you died on July 3rd, that meant you had also, years before, been conceived on July 3rd. So then they just did the math. If Jesus died on March 25th, well, then he was conceived on March 25th. Add nine months to that, and you get December 25th. The point I'm trying to make to you is that there's nothing special about December 25th. Okay? Obviously, though, the, the day Jesus actually was born is pretty significant, pretty important. And that wasn't the only important day in those, those early days of our Savior's life. We have another one today in, a, in our lesson. Luke tells us about two... God-fearing people, he introduces us to these two really fascinating characters, Simeon and Anna. And what he's doing is he's recording for us the day that the Redeemer was presented. He is the light of the world. And God's people reflect that light. As our lesson begins... Mary and Joseph and Jesus are in Jerusalem. This would have been after Jesus' circumcision, which would occur on the eighth day. And actually, Luke records for us why they were there. Just got to find it. Uh, verse 27, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary according to the law. So there's this custom. What, what custom? What custom of the law was this? Well, it's based on two passages uh, from the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 13 told the people that the firstborn male, human or animal, in the family was to be given to God. Uh, consecrated to him to, to serve God as, as an animal, as a, as, as a sacrifice. As a human being, 
well, to serve God like, like a priest would, day, day and night, to have a life totally dedicated to God. Thing is, though, God also said that the Levites were to dedicate their entire lives to serving him. So he gave the people an out, we could say. November, November, Numbers 18, verse 16, talking about this firstborn male who was to be given to God, then says, when they are a month old, you must redeem them at the redemption price set at five shekels of silver. So come to the temple, give your firstborn son to God, and then buy him back with five shekels. Kind of seems like a whole bunch of wasted effort, right? Why would God tell the people to consecrate their sons to God and then just buy him right back? Well, like, so much of the Old Testament worship, it was all about pointing ahead. It was a symbol, it was a big object lesson pointing ahead to the Messiah who would redeem the world. As God bring people, Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple to do as the custom of the law required. You see the beautiful symmetry to this act with Jesus? It's, it's almost ironic. The Redeemer of the world himself was redeemed. Albeit in a different sense, for just five shekels of, of silver. And in addition to that, the whole purpose had been to buy back their sons from a life dedicated to serving God as priests. But with this child, no one has ever been more consecrated more dedicated, more set aside to serving God than Jesus, our great high priest. Jesus, the redeemer of the world, is himself redeemed. And there were some people there to witness this tremendous event. Simeon, fascinating character. I'm always fascinated by these these characters that appear in Scripture and, and, and make kind of a big impact, and then you don't, you don't hear from them again. Who's Simeon? Well, some tradition tells us that Simeon is actually the head, the president of the Sanhedrin, that he was the father of Gamaliel, the Pharisee who would defend the apostles later in Acts chapter 5. He's an old man, or is he? I'm guessing that most of you probably picture an old man when you think of Simeon, and that's based on Simeon's own words when he says in verse 29, Lord, you now dismiss your servant in peace. We, we sing those words quite often in our liturgy. And the traditional understanding of that has been Simeon's talking about dying. He's saying, <laughs> Lord, now, now you'll let me let me die. Dismiss your servant. Maybe a real literal translation here is, is Simeon is saying, "You now release your slave." Simeon had been given this tremendous job, this tremendous responsibility of waiting for the Messiah. In fact, he'd been told that he would live long enough to see the Messiah. It's a tremendous blessing, tremendous promise. One of the greatest that any human being has ever received. So the thought would be, perhaps Simeon is just saying, well, now that task is over, because I've actually seen the Messiah. Would have been a pretty cool thing to be Simeon, wouldn't it? Could you imagine just the joy and energy with, with which he would, would greet every day? Today might be the day. God has promised to me that I will see the Messiah. Now, on this particular day, it says the Spirit moved him. He was moved by the Spirit. So I picture, I still do kind of like to picture Simeon as an old man. So I picture an old man running to the temple. He knows what he's going to find. 
And then I'd like to slip into the shoes or the sandals of Mary and Joseph. You're there to do this, this kind of this rite of passage, this important uh, religious ritual, and all of a sudden some man grabs your child and starts saying these amazing things. And this is really the most significant part of this lesson. What Simeon says about this, this little baby. My eyes have seen your salvation, literally your saving thing. Could translate it as Savior. Simeon knew exactly who this was. He actually had a proper understanding of what the Messiah, who the Messiah would be. We talked about how so many people had this misconception. Simeon got it. He knew exactly who this was. My eyes have seen your salvation. A light, a revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. This child is a light. Ever thought about how many lights we use as symbols at Christmas? Does that have something to do with how it's such a dark time of year? Sure. Yep, we like to light up the darkness, but it's also a perfect symbol for Christmas. Jesus is the light. For the Gentiles, the Gentiles have been living in darkness for centuries, millennia, not knowing who the true God is, not knowing how to be saved. Jesus is now the light. He's a light revealing salvation. But we aren't to think of like a spotlight or a flashlight shining on some sort of how-to, some sort of guide, this is how to be saved. No, the light is the salvation. The light is the saving thing himself. What did he reveal about himself? He reveals God's love for us. This little child would grow up and be willing, have enough love for us to let himself be sacrificed. The Redeemer. The price he would pay was certainly way more than five shekels. He would give up, give up his own life, his own blood to save us, to save Simeon, to, to save Anna. He is still a light revealing salvation. You came here on this bitterly cold morning. And in a sense, you were like Simeon. Simeon ran to... I doubt any of you ran. But Simeon ran to the temple to see Jesus. You come here to word and sacrament. It's the same thing. That's how Jesus reveals himself to you and I. Through his word, through his body and blood through the water and word of baptism, it's the same. And that's why we still sing the same song Simeon sang, because it makes sense, it works for us as well. The Redeemer is presented, he's a light revealing salvation, and God's people reflect that light. We are like mirrors reflecting the light of Christ. Anna is a tremendous example, another fascinating character that we just get a little glimpse of. With Anna, we know for sure she was old. Really old. From the tribe of Asher, one time called the least of the tribes. The significant thing Luke says about her is that she never left the temple complex. Serving God day and night. Now obviously, it's a bit of a figure of speech. No one can literally be serving God 24 hours a day, even while they're sleeping. The point is that she served God very, very faithfully. And not like, not like the Pharisees, who did so in an act of self-righteousness to get attention. No, this was, this was real. This was a genuine service to God. And she, too, received this tremendous blessing of seeing the Messiah. Did, did the Holy Spirit reveal to her that this, this is the Christ? Or, or did she just figure it out from Simeon's words? I'm not really sure. 
What we do notice with Anna, though, is how she responds. Standing nearby that very hour, she gave thanks to the Lord. She kept speaking about the child to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Have you noticed how many times already that has happened in the young life of Christ? Everyone who finds out about him tells others. The angel told the shepherds. The shepherds told people. Simeon in the very public temple shouted about it. And now Anna goes around telling everybody who's waiting for redemption that she's seen redemption. She has seen the Redeemer. It's just a natural response to the good news, to the gospel message. I'm not doing anything. I'm just the mirror reflecting that light, right? And so are you. You're just mirrors reflecting the light of Christ to others. Christmas is always a wonderful opportunity to do that. Hopefully you had some opportunities to share with people the true meaning of Christmas this year. You know, we, we pray that among the many people who worship with us Christmas Eve, there were some who did not yet know the true meaning of Christmas, who did not yet know about the Redeemer, and that we pray the Holy Spirit worked through the message that the children so beautifully presented to lead those people to trust in their Redeemer. It is an important day, this, this, this day in the temple. It's, it's, it's something that's kind of easy to skip over. But it's really significant. The Redeemer himself is presented. He is redeemed. And two different people recognize the incredible moment. Recognize who this little baby is. And give us an example of how we too respond. We respond by praising God. We respond by sharing that news. We respond by reflecting the light of Christ to others. Amen. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. Amen. Please stand as we confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to us living in the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You may be seated as we collect our faith offering. Please also sign the friendship registers in your pew.